Um, and today my colleague Ariana is going to be leading this uh, conversation. Ariana, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Ariana Martinez, she, her, Ella. I'm a grad student at the School of Rossier and a graduate student intern here at the Career Center. Thanks, Ariana. Um, and with that, we will take it away with our discussion today. Um, for everyone's convenience, I'm going to put the profiles for all of our panelists in the chat. Feel free to have that up as you're listening to them speak so you can understand their different backgrounds. Thank you, Liz. And with that, we'll go straight to the panel. So today we have Ned, Armand, Amelia, Gabriela, and Megan as our panelists. And we'll get started with Megan. So what do you look for in an, an organization when applying to internships and jobs? Um, I would say from my experience with recruiting, uh, a lot of times I would ask um, specific groups, um, like specifically women, um, what their experience was like at the firm. Um, also, anybody in the LGBTQ community, um, it was really important for me to hear like firsthand experience from them. Um, I look for diversity programs, um, especially I think those are really great um, to like foster inclusivity. And then I also look to see um, what kind of people are at the you know top positions in a firm, um, because it can show, I guess, how much they value diversity. Um, not just in the beginning when they're hiring people, but also as they move through the ranks in the company. At least for myself, I can say when I'm applying, I really look for, is there room for growth at the company? And if so, who is kind of excelling in that company? Um, is there space to move horizontally, laterally, or is it just all off like a pyramid? And I also think ESG for me is like what, particular things is that company doing to contribute or get back? What are they taking stands on? And what are their values as a company, not just superficially on their website? I think just going off of what both Megan and Amelia said, uh, I also look for what the mission is of the company. Um, for someone that wants to go into the legal field, I'm very interested in knowing if they have social justice initiatives, uh, if they're open to working in community service. It's more about and less about what they say they want to do and more about what they actually do. Like, do they work with the community? Are they actually demonstrating uh, initiative towards that? Um, and I also look for diversity and mentorship. Um, there's people in positions of power that um, are representative of the backgrounds that I feel that I identify with. I would like to um, be able to work under them and have hands-on experience and the ability to grow and learn everything that I can from them. I think also similar to my peers, for me, it's super important to look at opportunities that are paid because um, as a first gen student, I don't have really like that lean way where I can depend on um, like a different sort of help. So for me, I'm really look for like internships that will allow me to grow through mentorship and also provide that um, that opportunity to have that mentorship with that program and also for it to be a paid position so that I won't have to work another job to participate in it and still have the opportunity to get, like gain the experience. Yeah, I agree with um, what everyone else was saying. I think it's really important to make sure that um, DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are um, a really important part of the company's mission statements and just to make sure that they've created a lot of space for those kind of um, organizations and that these ERGs and programs are active and they actually um, have those groups that can offer support and networking to different kinds of people at the company. Thank you all for sharing. So yes, I heard a lot of like about the mission statement, diversity mentorship, um, support groups. So moving on to the second question, how do you feel about organizations that have specific diversity opportunities or leadership programs? Are they positive or negative? And Gabriela, would you like to start us off with that one? Sure. Uh, I think when I see those initiatives within the company, I think of the company in a more positive light. It's important to know that the company's investing in opportunities for um, underrepresented communities. And it also gives you the space to know that you can grow more and it gives you access to that that you wouldn't really have at 
other companies that don't have these opportunities. And it, it's an, an advantage point, I believe. Um, I would consider it to be so. I agree. Um, I think it shows like thoughtfulness and intention uh, from a company. And so um, I, I usually think of it as a positive kind of direction. It shows that they're putting an effort. Um, and I also think, you know, having that space where people can engage with other professionals that might have a similar background to them is really important. Um, I think at least for myself, it makes me feel more comfortable and inclined to work with a company just because I think for a lot of us, maybe we don't have family or people to look up to in the corporate environment. So I think really traversing that can be intimidating and deterring for a lot of us. And when I see companies making the conscientious effort to combat it and bridge that gap for a lot of people, it shows me that they're aware of the issue and that they're working towards um, including people and giving people a space at the table that we wouldn't otherwise feel welcomed for organically. Yeah, I think the only situation in which it could be seen negatively is um, when those companies have these uh, specific diversity opportunities just so they feel like they can check a box or fulfill a quota. But like everyone was saying, it's important um, to look at the company's intention and see if they're intentionally trying to be inclusive. Um, and if those programs demonstrate like that commitment to intentional inclusivity. So thank you. So overall, it was, you know, positive. Um, it's a space to feel comfortable. But if it is negative, you know, it's seen as, you know, just checking a box. So with that in mind, what recommendations do you have for organizations that are hoping to increase access to underrepresented students? And Armand, would you like to start us off with that one? Sure. I think um, for underrepresented underrepresented students, it's um, really important to offer those outreach and recruitment programs, but also to offer maybe scholarships and financial aid to those underrepresented, underrepresented students who don't have access to a lot of resources that other students do. So um, to reduce those financial barriers is really important for those kinds of students, and it can really help attract uh, a wide um, diversity and array of different kinds of students. Um, not just those who don't face economic challenges, um, but, you know, all kinds of students are looking to advance their career and, uh, and their um, education. So it's important to sort of provide those resources for everyone. Um, and yeah, that's really important. I think also similar to that, I think if a company kind of creates easier programs that are like pipeline to have an internship that would be super beneficial um i myself like am new to the entire recruiting process and i think essentially like when i first began i didn't know that there was a process to even begin with so i think maybe if companies invest in like creating pamphlets or um speaker notes where they can teach people what like recruiting is like recruiting 101 could be super beneficial because there are some careers that like you can learn from and have like having that previous experience can set you up a lot further had you started earlier so I think definitely like maybe um having those resources maybe online resources hey this is what how to apply how to stand out as a candidate um, I think that could be super beneficial for people. I think another great opportunity for companies to really expand and increase access to underrepresented students is um, reaching out to cultural centers at different universities. I work at La Casa, which is our Latino cultural center uh, on campus. And we get emails from different companies saying, oh, we have this internship opportunity. Um, can you please like shout this out to your students? Or we've even had people from different organizations and different companies reach out to do um, an event with us and we'll host them. Um, and then they'll do like a speaker panel. And I think that in of itself gives students access to different opportunities, exposes them to different organizations, different lines of work that they may be never considered. Um, and then being able to plug that just for all the students in like 
our La Casa has a weekly newsletter we send out and we'll put those opportunities in there. And I think um, outsourcing in that way and trying to make the, the smallest even effort to send an email really does make a difference in uh, expanding outreach. I agree with that, especially um, like I work at the LGBT center and there's a lot of opportunities where um, companies can be more, um, I guess, seen on campus. Um, I feel like the companies that host events are really successful in getting you know to know students. Also, um, being clear about deadlines is really great. I know when I was um, recruiting, I I'm also first gen and low income, and so it was very difficult to um, navigate some of these deadlines. Uh, a lot of people seem to have it very figured out, and I was like, okay, I needed to like make my own spreadsheet with all the deadlines for the companies that I was applying for. And so I think maybe having like yeah, like streamlining streamlining it a little bit, like having a pamphlet would be a great idea. Um, as Annette was saying, and just making sure that they're very clear about, you know, when things are due and events that they're having coming up, um, just to increase like transparency and then also presence on campus. All right, thank you. So yes, I hear a lot about making just these opportunities more accessible and as well as uh, reducing financial barriers. So um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, moving on to our fourth question. What questions about your identity or diversity initiatives do you want to ask employers, but typically don't? And anyone is welcome to jump into that. I think a common cliche is like, asking what the work culture is like, but I think more so like how is um, your kind of like well-being at the company? How do you feel? Um, how do you feel with your coworkers? Because that's an environment that eventually we'll be stepping into and taking charge of. I think also just like, how do you think transparently things are communicated and um, things that are expected of you, how is conflict handled and just those kind of sticky things. Um, because you don't, I feel like you don't find out about them until you're like in them and not knowing about how people deal with it on a corporate level um, can be confusing. And I feel like um, can be easier to get into conflict with, you know? Similar to that, I think something that um, is super important about, or like I've always had some thoughts on is like how companies support their neurodivergent staff and I think that's something super important. And I know when you're applying to jobs and internships, there's kind of like this thing that says like, um, like disabilities and like check it off and like, we won't hold this against you. But I guess like more transparency of like what that information does or like, is there support for students that are neuro, I mean, employ workers that are neurodivergent. So kind of just like, what are different pathways for people that might have different intersectionalities? Like, yes, you're first gen, but you might have different um, like intersectionalities to your identity, I think is something important companies could um, make an emphasis on. I think another one for me is in terms of diversity initiatives, are companies is the company actively recruiting and making this job post accessible to communities of color or um, underrepresented communities? Because I know that there's certain like job boards for people identify as Latino. So it'd be like a Latino, uh, Latinos in political science job posting board. Uh, is the job being listed there? Is the company making strides in to recruit people from underrepresented communities? That's one thing uh, as well. Because you can say that the you consider everyone regardless of their race and make that effort, but to actively recruit within the community is another thing and takes a couple more steps. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing all of you. Um, so I heard a little bit about, you know, the war culture. Keeping that in mind, um, moving on to question five. When you are employed at a, an organization, what makes you feel supported? How do you feel valued? Speaking from personal experience, um, whenever there's this uh, 
the environment has a lot of flexibility. I think that's what makes me feel most supported just because sometimes things happen with life and family and school. And it's very important for your employer to let you know that number one, they value your work. And two, that if you need more flexibility, that that's okay. As long as the work gets done. I had an experience in my internship where I was really stressed with family life or with family things in school. And I knew I had to come in to finish this assignment for a deadline. And I kind of put all my other personal problems on a back burner to finish my assignment because I knew that it was due and I had to get it done. Um, but my boss had seen or had talked to me about like what was going on because um, she had noticed that I looked a little sadder that day. And I was just transparent with her and I told her what was going on. Um, but I told her not to worry that I would get the assignment done regardless. And she just sent me home because she said it's not worth this assignment's not worth like your mental well-being. So to know that your mental well-being, your mental health and um, your just state of mind is more valued than anything is how I think employers can really make their staff feel supported. I think similarly on that is I think mentorship in a lot of these roles. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that maybe you don't feel like comfortable raising or um, just asking about in like a normal meeting. So I think having the opportunity to gain mentorship from um, a boss or, or a coworker, I think is huge, especially for that to be fostered, you know? So maybe that could be like non-work events to kind of humanize management or people in higher roles um, to really kind of gauge their experience, their background with yours and how their path has looked outside of the office environment. Um, I think at one of my past internships, they had smaller socials um, like lunches or uh, different events. And I think that really helped me connect with new um, people as mentors. I also think that um, like when looking for kind of an organization, it's important to feel like you're in an inclusive workplace. So whether that be seeing that your colleagues look like you or think like you um, can really make sure that your unique perspective is like valued and appreciated um, and making sure that your voice is heard um, and feeling like you have an, a community in that organization and you're not just um, an outlier. Um, so diversity for me personally is really important. And um, like everyone else was saying, access to those opportunities for skill development and training. Thank you. So earlier, some of you guys mentioned like deadlines and just making things more accessible. Uh, with that in mind, what is the most frustrating aspect of the recruiting process when seeking a job or internship? Is there anything you wish recruiters knew when you would that would enhance the student recruitment process? I think for me, the hardest part, or I guess the most frustrating part of recruiting was um, it felt like everyone around me knew exactly what they were doing because they had like family that, you know, had had were in similar careers. And for me, it was different. Um, so it was very overwhelming at first to just kind of like get into the recruiting space to begin with. Um, obviously a lot of events can feel overwhelming um, and obviously deadlines, you know, they come really fast. And so just, I was lucky enough that my roommate um, was recruiting at the same time as me and she had more experience, but um, it was very difficult to navigate um, that like whole start of recruiting, I would say. Um, so ideally, I think recruiters could, I guess, be maybe more transparent about scheduling events, like the, like sending out like a schedule, you know, of upcoming events, and then also again like deadlines as well, um, just to make it a little bit easier because it was kind of like um trial and error as far as like knowing you know what events are necessary what events aren't um when you're trying to recruit for a business and so I feel like kind of being more transparent for students that may be new to this process um is really important 
I think for me, um, the biggest frustration when I'm looking at um, different internships or going through the recruiting process is the lack of hands-on opportunities for um, specifically in the legal field. Uh, I feel like every time I find an internship or a fellowship that's interesting and has hands-on elements, it's you have to be a 1L, you have to be a 2L, 3L in law school. Um, when I look at the job description and based off my internships, I do have the experience and I do have the qualifications to do that position. And I feel like I would be successful at it, but uh, I'm limited to the fact that I'm a ba- I only have a bachelor's or I'm going to be, um, I'm going to receive my bachelor's in, in May. So I feel like I'm limited in that way. And I can't get the experience I want during my gap year because of the fact that I am not enrolled in law school yet. So it's stuff like that when it's very narrow, even though that you feel like you fit the qualifications, you can't just by the the simple byline that you are not in, in law school. So that's, I think, for me, the most frustrating. I think for me, when interviewing and applying, I've had it happen very often where you're getting to very close you're throughout the process and then if they decide to move on with a different applicant i found that they won't even send you a rejection email you know um which for me can be demoralizing it's dehumanizing um and you're also just left hanging and it's very discouraging so i think for me even getting a simple like thank you we've decided to move in another direction from employers would be i think a big help you know so you're not just left wondering like what happened. I also think when I was like a freshman and sophomore, I had struggled to get internships because I could never figure out the timeline for the application cycles. And I think being more transparent about it, like we start recruiting for this summer internship a year from now, or we start recruiting for the next spring internship in the fall. I think being more transparent about when you guys are recruiting um, and the timelines for that, I think Making it more known would be a greater help to especially younger students, more underrepresented students to get their foot in the door. So um, coming from an engineering student's perspective, um, the things that I've experienced are uh, the job market and the students around me. There's a really high amount. There's a huge saturation of engineers, um, but there are not a lot of positions for those kinds of roles. So um, at a lot of these career fairs, it'll just be a lot of students kind of bombarding one employer and then having to wait in a super long line. And then they don't end up really getting to say much to the employer. Um, and then it turns into sort of a game of trying to uh, play the um, automated uh, resume system and just trying to get your resume passed because there's such a huge amount of applicants for every kind of position. So that part's been really frustrating. Um, and I think that's mostly just due to the nature of the job market and um, those kinds of engineering roles right now, um, like in uh, computer science and data science. But um, I think from a recruiter's perspective, just making sure that you're, um, like they said, being transparent about those deadlines, making sure that you're recruiting from a diverse uh, group of people, because um, not all of those students have access to things like referrals, extra interview practice, those kinds of things. So really just being transparent and and saying, hey, this is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and it's not always easy to be like, hey, this is why we rejected you. Um, th- we felt like you were really good in this aspect, X, Y, Z, because there are just so many applicants for every position. Um, but yeah, just making sure that uh, transparency is key. Thank you. All right, so moving on to our seventh question. Again, like keeping in mind, like, well, it's already stressful enough. So what equity and inclusion initiatives would exist at your ideal organization? I feel like for me, um, what in- equity and inclusion initiatives look like at my due organization uh, would be one centered around actively recruiting in low-income and in underrepresented communities. Um, 
I think there's not enough opportunities directed for, I think, students at community colleges specifically. Um, a lot of companies will direct all their attention to um, high ranking prestigious universities, but never really consider the kids at the state schools or the the community colleges. So I think if a company's really committed to uh, equity and inclusion, you start at the the ground level at the community colleges because it's not that they are not capable of performing well at schools. A lot of times it's financial barriers. Um, so I think focusing those initiatives um, at those those schools and um, facilitating a type of mentorship program that will guide them through and maybe set them up for a full-time position once the internship's over. I think that's very important for both low-income and underrepresented communities. Kind of building off that, um, I think it's, to me, it's really important to see how the company is retaining these employees. So it's one thing to, you know, do a bunch of diversity recruiting and get um, you know, di diverse thinking, but then as you're promoting them, like, is it the same person getting promoted to upper level or do you have programs in place where maybe you can do extra training or, um, you know, continual like programs throughout uh, their career so that more diverse voices can get to the upper level. So I think that it's important to see companies invest in employees not just in the beginning, but also in the long term. So, um, you know, like if if they can continue some of these recruiting programs um, for like promotions, I think that that's really important so that you can see people advancing and not just getting entry level roles and then maybe they fall through the cracks. So um, making sure that companies are really like, I guess, like doing what they say that they're going to do and keeping those employees is really important. I think something really cool that I've seen recently is sometimes companies will come to campus um, to do these Trojan talks and they'll specifically come to organizations like um, women in engineering, queers in engineering, or different organizations. Uh, and they'll come to specifically those groups of people. So they have like a sort of small, more intimate environment where they're talking to those people who are less represented. And so I think implementing sort of proactive strategies like that to attract a diverse pool of talent is really important. And creating those par partnerships with these diverse organizations is really important. Um, and I think that, I don't know if we already talked about that question with Trojan Talks, but um, yeah, I think that was really cool. Um, because so companies that really take an active step towards implementing those kinds of strategies to attract that um, diverse pool of talent is really important. Yeah, so thank you. So I hear, you know, just consider community college students as well, extra training, promotions, partnerships. And with it in mind, um, for organizations in the beginning stages of outreach or recruitment, what advice can you offer for engaging with underrepresented students? I think companies could definitely reach out to um, individual schools and seek those members and those identities and kind of like ask them for their advice and like what they would implement in a program or what they're looking for. I think that allows them to kind of have a, a better understanding of the individual that is facing, I guess, those challenges. So I think that allows it to be more cohesive and like a much more partnership. I would say um, as far as like recruiting goes, um, try to have like diverse voices also on your recruiting team um, so that you can have people that are familiar with the background that you're maybe trying to recruit from um, and then they can reach out to organizations on campus. I think having a strong presence on campus is really important um, because having like being able to be face to face with students is great and reaching out to all of the um, different organizations that we have like there's so many at USC um, and so many in the just in the SCIP like initiatives as well like 
there's so many people to reach out to. And I feel like there's a lot of opportunities uh, to hear from diverse voices, like you said before. Yeah, and so echoing from that, um, I think this has done a great job with just having the diversity meet and greet um, recruitment event where we just have like recruiters that are very intentional for their diverse initiatives. So um, definitely an opportunity for employers and as well as students. Um, but moving on to question number eight, um, as all of you are campus leaders, how do you create a sense of belonging and inclusion within your student orgs? Um, I try my best to advocate for representation and to make also step up and also step back for when people need to speak their truth about their experiences because you can't speak for everyone. Um, I think I'm well on campus i'm the president of pi sigma alpha which is the national political uh, science honor society and one of the things that our organization took upon themselves was the um address the lack of diversity in the political science department at usc um so we've been <clears throat> doing our best to like reach out to faculty reach out to um to administrators and one thing we did um at our group's level was advertise the position um, of hiring political science faculty to um, different PhD students and different faculty across the country at different universities that identify as um, Black and Latino because we wanted more Black and Latino representation in the department. So we personally sent emails to different um, potential candidates and asking them to apply for the position. And if they are not um, interested in applying, if they could advertise it to their networks, um, because it's something that we're very passionate about and we think um, the university should be doing a better job at addressing it. So I think um, that's one way is being vocal, being vocal and not just saying you wanna do something, but actually doing it, uh, I think is very important in creating a sense of belonging and inclusion um, because it shows that you're willing to take action for them and that you you care about the community. Um, so I think that's one way to do it. I think um, I work at the LGBTQ Center. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we do well here specifically, and this isn't just me, but I, pretty much ever, everybody that works here is just approaching people with a very like opening mindset so like understanding giving people benefit of the doubt like immediately um just have like feeling i guess compassion for people to begin with and um you know assuming the best rather than the worst and so um i think you know creating a sense of openness with people like they can share their struggles um they can share you know parts of their personality that maybe they can't share in class is really important um, also making sure that people feel um, that they can share their pronouns, you know, if they have anything that they want to share about their identity. Um, obviously, the LGBT, you know, umbrella is really broad. And so we also have affinity groups where people can um, engage with, you know, different members of um, the community that maybe they participate in. And I think that's also something that I liked a lot. Um, during my internship, I interned with Deloitte. Um, it was really nice that there was these different affinity groups um, within the um, company so that people could engage with, um, you know, people that had their similar background. And I feel like that's really important, especially for professionals um, to find support or mentors uh, with people in their company that maybe have like a similar um, background or, or like culture as them. And then Arman and Anand, is there anything that y'all want to add? Any values that really create the sense of belonging at USC? Um, I'd like to echo every, um, like what Gabriella and Megan said. I think it's super important to kind of just assess a situation and determine what you can do to um, 
like support the group. I personally work at the First Gen Plus Success Center. And here we have like four of the um, identity groups. We have undocumented students, former, fo um, sorry, former, fo former um, foster youth, transfer students and first gens. So for me, myself, I can only identify as a first gen student. So I am someone that like, when we do have to kind of implement the other um, groups to create programming for, I make sure to reach out to pro to already orgs on campus that are able to assess me and help me so that I'm not speaking over someone. I'm allowing, I'm like in community with someone and creating that space for them. So for me, it's really about kind of just reading the room and then determining from there what my next steps are. But I really like to kind of just give everyone space to be who they are and like what they share. So I think for myself, that's really how I like to lead and um I think it's been super important um definitely like the role I have here has definitely shaped me to be the leader I am today but I definitely know that like everyone in SEIP is so super welcoming super kind and I think that's super important just echoing off of what everyone else said um, making sure to use inclusive language uh, being uh, accepting of everyone's uh, background or identities and also being knowledgeable about those kinds of things and how to respect um, people's backgrounds and where they come from and how to be inclusive is also really important. Um, and I think coming to this session is um, a great way to learn about those kinds of things and um, just making sure to keep doing things like this and um, be a more inclusive organization. Thank you. Um, so I know we all briefly kind of answered this question already, but if we could go a little bit more in detail as to how would you like employers to engage with students on campus? And how do you like to receive information about opportunities from employers? Um, I think Gabriella mentioned this earlier, but uh, lots of the SEIP programs will have um, newsletters that they send out. And so for me, I really like looking through the newsletter and seeing if there's, um, you know, any information that they can share about the program or about the opportunity, uh, just because it feels like it has like an extra backing, I guess, because it's going through the LGBT center or whatever, you know, SEIP initiative they're going through. Um, it feels more official. Um, it's a little bit easier to find those opportunities when, um, companies reach out specifically to these programs because um, it shows like initiative, intention, thoughtfulness, like et cetera. Um, and then it, also like as students, I feel like we get a lot of emails like from employers, like we'll get like Handshake or USC Career Center, like we do get a lot of these emails. And so um, being able to filter it a little bit through like, you know, whatever identity you may um, feel, you know, hold to then you can uh kind of filter it more and it makes it a little bit easier to um, figure out which companies are making an effort you know to support um, whatever background you associate with i feel like for me half the battle is even finding out that some of these job posts exist or that these programs exist because um i feel like they can be so niche and i think a good way to combat that is again going to student clubs and organizations and partnering with them, but also faculty. I feel like when I hear from professors, when I hear from counselors, it um, and they bring that to my attention, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more, not trustworthy, but I, um, yeah, I guess it's more reliant. And I also, it's more of a direct way than just reading it online or getting an email about it for myself. I personally really like Trojan talk, talks um, because it's a way to get your your uh, yourself in front of a, an employer physically and just talk to them. Um, and I think the most important thing to talk about in a Trojan talk is those DEI initiatives and what sets you apart from other companies, like what makes you so special um, and why it's important that you would come and talk to these students in person. Um, and I think that face-to-face -face time is real crucial. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you all for answering our questions. Now we're going to move on to the audience questions. And we already have one on the chat. And I see Christina raising her hand as well. But I'll be reading the first one from the chat. So Christina said, thank you so much for being here and sharing your perspectives. What things do you see as a red flag when you are researching a potential employer? I think for me, um, the first thing that I thought of was um, I obviously did recruiting for um, the accounting uh, field. So we went to, um, you know, like meet the firms is a big um, event for accounting and big four and mid-tier firms. Um, for me, it would be a red flag if uh, all the people that they had there were of the same background, I think having diverse voices. Especially when you're recruiting is really important. And so different cultures and races is really important. Um, and it would it would probably be a red flag to me if I walked in and and there was companies that didn't have um, any diversity as far as like the type of people they're having represent the firm. Yeah, so I know there's like a bit of like the internet being like weird and it just kind of sounds a little bit weird, but I was able to grasp a little bit and it said something um, in between like um, a way it's, you know, just making sure there's diverse voices and diversity that there's people that look like us um, is definitely will be more of a green flag. And when we don't see that, obviously that's a red flag. So now um, I guess we can move on to Christina. You're welcome to unmute yourself or put the question in the chat as well. Awesome, thank you. Thank you all uh, so much. Um, my name is Christina Gutierrez. I am the Associate Director of Talent Acquisition and Onboarding at Vera Institute of Justice. And I just first wanna say how inspiring it is to hear from all of you, because at the internship level and also at the highest level within the organization, these are all things that we focus on. And so I'm glad to hear that you're all thinking of that as well. Um, going back to one of the questions, um, the recommendations that you have for organizations who are hoping to increase access to underrepresented students. Um, somebody said something, uh, they said recruiting 101. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. How can I get that out there? I want to I want to position you for um, for success. It shouldn't be a pop quiz of how to apply and how to stand out. My question to you all being that there is a generational difference. Where do you go? Where do you look for resources like this? If I'm looking to create something that you would find, what platforms do I go to? I don't know how to tick the talk or snap the chats. So help me get in front of you. <laughs> That's my question. Thank you. I think a really great way to interact with, I think the younger generation is LinkedIn. It's like the best way to find access to internships as well as resources for those types of things. Um, I know that one of my best friends had a really hard time finding internships for music industry. And I have no experience with the music industry. But I just told her, go on LinkedIn and type in music industry internships. And I promise you something will pop up. And I sat with her for like 20 minutes and we like found a list by the time we were done. Um, so I think LinkedIn is a really great way to advertise and get in front of you, um, get in front of uh, a lot of the younger generation. And then I think if you could use Instagram to a certain extent. I think most of the demographic uses Instagram uh, and create infographics about the organization um, so people understand what it is, advertise the internships that way um, and just connect with different universities via Instagram and just like send a message, say, oh, can you guys reshare this? And a lot of cultural centers like La Casa will do that. Um, so I think that's like a really great way to get in front of the younger generation. Also, specifically, I know there's this is a thing at the engineering school, but they their career portal has partnerships with certain employers so that all of those employers resources come up first on our career and job portals and 
boards that are specifically for engineering students. Um, and so um, they push them forward and then students are able to see those quicker than if I were to search for a position on LinkedIn or Indeed or something like that. But making sure that that your organization maybe has a partnership with those schools that you're interested in recruiting from. Yeah, kind of echoing that. Um, I don't know if my if my Wi-Fi is doing good. I'm on USC Wi-Fi, <laughs> but um, I think kind of coordinating with uh, any connections that you may have on campus. So, um, for instance, Leventhal sends out a lot of career um, emails. I do check those usually. Uh, every school will have like a specific email list where they can send careers or um, opportunities to students. And so I feel like, and as I can't remember who mentioned it before, but with professors too, I think it was Amelia um, mentioned, if you have connections with professors um, that can add like a level of trustworthiness. So it, it really does help to have connections on campus where you can reach out um, to get in touch with students because having some kind of um, backing, I guess, really helps with um, seeming more trustworthy as uh, opportunities. Thank you, Christina, for the question. So I have another question on the chat that was a direct message. So just asking like from the employer perspective and just given that all of you are busy students with classes and student life and social, uh, what would be the best time of the year and time of the day for an organization to host a recruiting event on campus for students? I would definitely say in the beginning of the semester, um, right in the beginning before like classes get really intensive. I think anywhere between maybe late October and December, there's no shot at getting a student to be available just because midterms are hectic. We have to go to office hours. Everyone has their clubs. That's when like a lot of clubs are in full swing for their um, their programming and all their events. So I think the earlier in the semester, the better, um, as close as it can be to, I guess, syllabus week would be the best. Similar to that, I think, for the very competitive roles like consulting and the tech field, I think it could be super important to kind of start students off towards the end of the academic school year. So that way when it's summertime, they have the time um, to look over their materials, edit resumes, work on that, kind of have an idea of what they need to prepare for fall semester. So I think maybe if we like incorporate a little bit of the end of the school year and um, kind of like the beginning, like Gabriela said, that could be very helpful. Thank you. So yeah, so even myself as a grad student, definitely in the beginning of the year and like maybe late, at night because or else I'm working or I'm in class but um we do have another chat another question on the chat I'm not sure if students will be able to answer this but does USC have any groups that support previously incarcerated stu students on that oh Sorry, on that end, I know that USC has the prison education project which they do collaborations with incarcerated uh like prisons and stuff and I know that um they're always like looking for more people I'm pretty sure I could send you a like a direct link to their website but we do have that resource where a lot of times students volunteer their time and work with um former incarcerated people yeah I was just gonna say exactly that um PEP is a great organization on campus they do a lot of good work uh, and they do their best to try to incorporate it into the USC curriculum. There's even like a RIT 320 class that everyone has to take RIT 320 to graduate. Um, and it's a writing class that you can take and you work uh, on a creative writing. No, it's not even creative writing. It's like an autobiography assignment, but you work with incarcerated students um, to write your own and also help them write their own. And you do peer reviewing with each other. And it's a really great um, program as well as organization that's on our campus. Thank you. That was a good question. And thank you, Liz, for putting the, the link on the chat. 
Um, but all right, so thank you to all the panelists for answering all of our questions and for the audience being engaging. Thank you so much. Um, so this is all that we have for today. Um, I'll pass it on to Liz if she has any final words, but thank you all. Thank you, Ariana, and thank you to our panelists. You were amazing today. Um, this was an incredible discussion and very insightful. You muted yourself. Thanks, Ariana. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, our panelists, you were incredible, very insightful. Ariana, thank you for leading the discussion. Um, thank you for joining. Um, and I did put in the chat a link to our DEI recruiting expo if anyone's interested in coming to recruit next semester. Um, and I will put my email in the chat if you don't want to reach me. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>